Okay, everybody, it is two o'clock central time, which is our appointed time to get started. Uh, my name is Rob Carr. I am with Oklahoma Able Tech. We are the Assistive Technology Act program for the state of Oklahoma. And I'm really glad that you all could break away from your busy days to join me for a little while this afternoon. And for those who might be watching the recorded version, glad that you could break away whenever you could to come in and uh, get a little bit of information. So we, we've talked quite a bit among our peers and other Assistive Technology Act programs uh, about the, the training needs and we've seen a lot of new faces and we know that a lot of our peers have invited folks to this conversation about accessible technology. So today we wanted to start uh, really kind of at the beginning uh, to, to begin to talk about and maybe for some of you reintroduce some of the fundamentals to accessible information and communication technology. Um, here in Oklahoma, I work in the accessibility space. Uh, I work with uh, the, a lot of our public sector, from agencies to higher ed institutions, a few cities and uh, a few private industry folks here or there, and all of the work centers around accessibility. And this is where we start the conversation with just about anybody that, that starts the conversation with us at AbleTech. In terms of housekeeping, especially answering questions, I welcome questions at any time. You, there's not really a, a hold for questions at the end approach here. If a question comes to mind, uh, type it into the chat window. I'll be watching in the chat for questions. Uh, you can also unmute yourself and uh, ask a question through the, the Zoom platform uh, audibly as well. There aren't uh, just a ton of us on, so I don't think that will be a big deal at all. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. When we talk about information and communication technology, this is a phrase that's used uh, pretty commonly nationally and internationally, and it includes anything that you can think of that would go on to a website, um, it includes some um, mobile apps. Well, it includes all mobile apps. It includes things like hardware, so information kiosks that you might interact with in a building. And it also includes so-called non-web content. This is your PDF for Word or PowerPoint documents. Uh, so when we talk about accessibility in all of those different kinds of technology, we're really talking about the things that that allow people to interact with this technology, uh, even though they might interact with their devices differently than we are, are accustomed to. So you can think about a lot of the features in the built environment that make it more accessible, like ramps and curb cuts and things like that. Similar kind of concept is just applied to the web and to web technologies. And the idea is that people's interactions with our websites, with our content, are as equivalent as possible, again, regardless of those different device interactions that they might have. So some of you may be familiar with a concept, it's called responsive web design. What it basically means is that if I have a website, it needs to work just as well for someone on a 40 inch monitor as it does on their handheld device. So responsive web design is something that web designers and application developers any more keep in mind when they put out a website or a piece of software. Um, and, and what you'll see is that websites might change. They might change the order of some of the content. They may change visibly a little bit based on the size of the screen that you have. This, this mindset, this thinking about how people interact with our content goes right alongside conversations about accessibility. Because again, what we're thinking about with accessibility is the same thing that we do with responsive. And that is, how many different ways might people interact with this thing that we have created? So for example, and for many of you in the assistive technology community, this especially is review. But I know there are a lot of folks that may not come from our sphere here. So when you think about interacting with the web, for many of us, the first thing we think about is a mouse and or a keyboard. For many of us, we don't use a mouse, whether it's because um, we can't use a mouse with our hands or we can't see the screen, so it doesn't really matter where a pointer moves around. Our interaction might be through a keyboard or at least a device or a technology that sends keyboard commands. So one of the fundamentals of web accessibility is being sure that websites are completely interactive only using a keyboard. 
that you don't force people to use a mouse. If you think about another device interaction, it might be that somebody drives their device and all of their software using something like Dragon Naturally Speaking. Uh, Dragon is, is one of several pieces of software that converts speech into text. And a lot of people are familiar with it as a dictation tool. A lot of us in the assistive technology space know it as just that, a piece of assistive technology. And people should be able to move around your website, interact with links and form fields and buttons and things like that, just speeching, speeching, excuse me, speaking in their natural language that they use Dragon with from a day-to-day -day basis. And in some cases, the fallback is for the, the Dragon user to start to speak some keyboard commands. And that's not fantastic. It's kind of like saying, okay, uh, let's get mouse grid on and then okay the site is accessible mouse grid is a, a feature that dragon brings up where you can very slowly and tediously move around a grid on the screen an accessible piece of software an accessible website is going to let somebody using dragon interact with it again just as they interact with installed software on their computer that might work really well then we have screen reading software and, and refreshable braille displays which are two very different technologies. They're still kind of related and a lot of the time they actually work together. So screen reading software does kind of what the name implies. Screen reading software converts what's in a website into uh, audible speech. It, it's more sophisticated than what it might sound like though because it doesn't only read aloud the text that's on a web page. What screen reading software does is it looks for a lot of the behind the screen information that's so important to the web and i'll get to this more when i get to some examples near the end of our time together today but when a screen reading software runs across say something like a section heading in a document that has multiple sections it needs to know that that section heading isn't just bolded and bigger text it needs to know that that heading is actually a heading for example uh, refreshable braille displays are very similar in that they're going to communicate dynamically through braille that pops up and then as the the reader reads across that line of braille and gets to the end the reader will tell it to go to the next line and the braille display will pop up a new line of braille and again it, it conveys some of this other information that's kind of tucked in back behind the screen Then we have something like this switch interface. This is a single button switch, um, and this shows somebody using that single button switch with a, a closed fist. Um, switches and the, the devices that we use increasingly work well together. Uh, if you have an Apple device, if you have a Microsoft device, there is a setting that basically says, let me interact with my device using a switch, and then you can configure what kinds of commands a switch will send. On screen now is a single button switch. There are also switches that um, have multiple buttons and in some cases they are really, really flexible in how you can position those buttons so that, say for example, someone uses a power wheelchair. I've seen a uh, power chair set up with switches on either side of the headrest so that someone can move their head back and forth because they might have mobility with their neck. And as they do that, they're sending different commands to their computers through the switches that are mounted up by their head on the headrests. In a lot of cases, these switches are sending keyboard commands as well. Again, it depends on the configuration, but it may be that someone has a switch button set up to do something like send a keyboard tab command. So again, even when we move into some of these other assistive technologies, we can see that keyboard accessibility is still a very important part of this conversation. And any more assistive technology isn't only for uh, folks who can't afford really expensive stuff. There is a lot of assistive technology that's built into our devices. If you have an Apple device, whether you use it or not, uh, you use this feature or not, you have a really powerful screen reader called VoiceOver. Um, uh, similarly, on Android, you have TalkBack. Narrator is the Windows version, and for quite a while, it really only worked with, say, Microsoft software. But the Microsoft team has been trying to catch up with VoiceOver and some of the other third-party 
uh, solutions as well and make Narrator a really competitive and effective screen reading tool. Then if you have a Chromebook, you have access to ChromeVox, which some people will argue is not a screen reader in the same way that some of these others are, but it provides a lot of the same interaction. It, it reads aloud content and cues from the web. You have a lot of Zoom features built into not only web browsers, but also to operating systems anymore. So you can turn on some levels of magnification, even just in the browser, so that if a font is super, super small, you can zoom in with the mouse or through the file menu, or in most browsers, you can just hit the control button on a PC keyboard and the plus, and it will begin to make the font larger. And that's built into the browsers. It's not as sophisticated as something like Zoom text. It's still something that a lot of folks may be able to use and it's portable and that it's gonna be in every browser that they interact with. And then you have things typically in an operating system where you can turn on high contrast mode, you can invert colors, and there are, there's a lot of flexibility in configuring the visible appearance of content on the screen as well. And Every single one of these things that I've talked about is built into the devices, which I think is really important when we think about the accessible web because more assistive technology is becoming available in devices by default. So people don't have to spend as much money to acquire effective assistive technology. So you might hear the, the term democratization that's kind of what's happening with assistive technology to an extent. There are a lot of limits to the built-in tools yet, with the exception of something like voiceover, which a lot of people that I know use as their primary and uh, full-time screen reading software. So that's your quick AT introduction for those of you who are new to the AT space. Uh, I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit and talk a, a bit about the legal side of this conversation about web accessibility. I literally have an hour long talk just about this. I'm not gonna cram all of that into the time that we have. I just mentioned that because there's a lot of little nitpicky details when we start talking about this. But at a high level at least, I want you to leave knowing a little bit more about the legal environment. So on screen now, I've got a, a picture of a, a ramp and a small set of stairs that are out in a public park. It's all concrete and we've got some hand railings and there are a few things that I readily admit probably don't meet the letter of the Americans with Disabilities Act in terms of the railing and I, I can't measure the, the grade of the ramp, for example, to know if it hits the mark. The point though is that accessibility is pretty familiar to us in the built environment whether we need these barriers to, to not exist in order for us to get around personally, or it's just something that we see every day with things like curb cuts and ramps. It's really, really familiar to us in the built environment. A lot of time though, we have things like this. This is a sign posted on the front of a store and it says wheelchair ramp available, inquire within, which is inherently pretty awful. You know, the, the assumption here is that someone who needs a wheelchair, I guess will have someone else come and help them to make this request. Because what this sign tells me is you can't get in the building without a ramp, but that they have a ramp available for you to use to get in the building. My brain gets stuck in this circular um, uh, pattern trying to figure this sign out. This definitely happens in the built environment. I think it happens a lot more of the time with technology where say someone tries to fill out a PDF form and they find as they go through it that they can't fill it out with the, when they use their assistive technology. In all of these cases, the, the barriers are environmental, right? They're, they don't exist because the person has a given disability. They exist because there's not accessibility in the environment. So to try to address that, we've got a lot of laws. Uh, we have some civil rights laws that uh, are, are pretty well known, especially the Americans with Disabilities Act. The Americans with Disabilities Act uh, talks about avoiding discrimination against people with disabilities in employment, in accessing public program services and activities, and then engaging with private program services and activities as well. 
Uh, we've got Title I that covers employment, Title II covers the public sector, and Title III covers the private sector. The civil rights provisions of the ADA actually grew out of the Federal Rehabilitation Act. The Rehabilitation Act is an older law that applies specifically to the federal government and contractors. If you get in and begin to read a little bit of, of these two, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act, you read a lot of terms and phrases that are, are the same or really, really similar. Uh, the Rehab Act, again, predates the Americans with Disabilities Act, but because it only applies to the federal government, and only requires federal agencies and contractors not to discriminate. Uh, back, oh, what is it now, 27 years, 28 years ago, the ADA uh, was written, signed into law by the first President Bush to carry those same civil rights provisions out into a bigger part of the country. So fundamentally in the US, we have these two really broad civil rights laws that say you can't discriminate against somebody on the basis of their disability. And these apply then pretty much to everybody. You know, the, the public sector is covered with the Rehabilitation Act federally and Title II at the state and local level. And Title III covers private sectors. So private education uh, institutions, restaurants, grocery stores, et cetera. So these are all really, really broad. And one of the things that's missing, especially from the Americans with Disabilities Act, is specific rules about what accessible technology looks and acts like. If you look at the rules that have come out of the Americans with Disabilities Act, you'll see that they have all kinds of measurements. Um, I mentioned the slope of that ramp that I showed a couple of slides ago. The slope of a ramp is defined under the Americans with Disabilities Act. We don't see those definitions when it comes to technology even though there are actually, if you will, building codes for the accessible web. So there's a, arguably a gap, even though these big civil rights provisions exist, there's not specific instruction about how to avoid discriminating through technology. So instead of looking at those, we look at standards. Uh, the World Wide Web is actually based on a whole big set of standards. And there is a subset of that that focuses on accessibility in particular. What the standards do is they tell us what accessible technology really looks and acts like. And we've got a few different standard sets. Internationally, we have the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is abbreviated WCAG and pronounced anything from WCAG to WCAG to some things that I probably haven't heard. That's the international accessible building code for the web, if you will. Here in the US, there's another part of the Rehabilitation Act, which is Section 508. And that points to federal agencies and people that do business with them. It also points to those of us who are Assistive Technology Act programs. And what the newer version of Section 508 does is it actually uses those web content accessibility guidelines as its baseline standards. And it goes a little bit further. It includes things that are specific to the, the non-web content that I talked to about a little bit to lead us off. So your PDF or PowerPoint content, things like that. But Section 508 actually applies pretty narrowly. Say a state agency has a a department that's federally funded. Well, Section 508 will get passed through to that department within the agency, but it won't directly apply to the, the whole state agency. So what many, many states have done, I think we're pushing 40 at this point, is they have defined web accessibility standards through state law and or state policy. Here in Oklahoma, we have a law like this um, that is issued by our central services agency, and it's very clear in that it applies to our executive agencies, our higher education uh, institutions on the public side, and our career and technical system as well. And it takes the standards and says, okay, all of you in the, in the, the huge slice of the public sector in the state, when you build, buy, or use technology need to apply these standards. So even if you're in a state um, or if you are in a state 
where you have a, an ICT accessibility law or policy, then that may be really helpful if you're having conversations with folks who ask the question, do we really have to do this? Because that gives you a more crystal clear answer. And what's missing, again, if you look at the federal laws, is the how do we do it part. And that's often reflected in, in the states. So I actually, I want to pause real briefly and see what questions you all might have up to this point. And again, you can unmute yourself in Zoom or feel free to type something into the chat as well. Very good. Okay, I will move on. Again, feel free to jump in with questions at any time at all. I'll keep an eye on the chat window. So we have this little bit of a gap in, in at least federal law. There are still a lot of things that push different organizations, uh, whether they're public or private, toward making their digital stuff more accessible. There are federal complaints that pop up in the public sector in particular that allege discrimination through technology, which for a lot of people might be kind of a foreign concept, but it's absolutely valid. You know, say uh, someone wants to pay their water bill online in their city. If they can't do that independently through the website, and maybe the city comes back and says, well, you can call between eight and five, we have this number right there. There's a really good chance that the city will find itself in hot water because there's no limit to when someone can pay a utility bill if it's on the internet, unless they literally only make that available between eight and five, which kind of defeats the purpose of having it on the internet. So situations like that can lead to complaints and, and those complaints, depending on how they're handled when they're made with the individual, uh, say city in the example that I just used, those complaints can escalate and get to where the Department of Justice Maybe the Department of Education, if it is in K-12 or higher ed, would come in and investigate. And usually in the public sector, these investigations are settled. So they don't ever go to a court. There's a binding settlement agreement that the institution or agency or city has to abide by. And those typically have kind of a short timeline. In other words, they might say, you've got to make your website accessible in a year or you have to make all of your digital stuff accessible in a year and a half, maybe two, which for medium to large cities and higher ed institutions and such, that's a big challenge. We also hear from district courts. So on the private sector, say you have a, a restaurant, maybe a grocery store that has a website and you sell stuff through that, or maybe you only exist online and someone can't come in and independently buy something through your website. Another situation where that individual that faces what they think is discrimination might file a lawsuit, and this is where the courts get involved. Private sector lawsuits often are just filed directly in a court. There's not a complaint necessarily to the, the company, the grocery store in this case. And so those often get moved up to district courts. And we see district courts uh, recently in particular, in their judgments say, okay, look, we know that the Americans with Disabilities Act doesn't have specific standards about web accessibility. That's not enough reason for somebody to not sue. In other words, we're going to let this case proceed even though we don't have specific guidance in this federal law. And that's a trend that we've seen in the private sector in the last few years. And Another trend in the private sector is we've seen an exponential growth over the last three to four years in lawsuits against private sector companies alleging that their websites aren't accessible. Another place that is actually, I think, really interesting um, and something that I'll try to keep an eye on is statements from the Department of Justice or the Department of Education. Sometimes they'll file what they call a statement of interest in a case. So say, a private uh, consumer files a lawsuit against uh, a grocery store chain or something like that, alleging that their website's not accessible. The Department of Justice may well come in 
and issue what they call a statement of interest. It's basically a letter that says, we're watching this, and they'll often make some very important points, like the Department of Justice has long held that the internet is protected by the Americans with Disabilities Act. That's not a direct quote, but that's a rough paraphrase of some of the statements that we see that come out of statements of interest and other documents that the federal agencies that enforce the ADA will produce from time to time. The complaints and the settlements that come out of them are more and more similar than they are different, especially in the last few years. So what we see is that the complaints themselves are generally going to be filed under the Americans with Disabilities Act and maybe sections 503 and 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So again, those are the big, broad civil rights laws. These lawsuits and complaints generally aren't filed under Section 508. Section 508 may be a part of the conversation, but someone is fundamentally alleging discrimination based on their disability. So they're not getting to specifics about standards. They're just saying, look, I can't independently use this piece of software, uh, this uh, grocery store app on my phone independently and, and, and without facing huge barriers. So that falls under the auspices of the civil rights laws. The complaints and the settlements generally result in whoever the, the company, agency, or institution is being required to make their technology accessible from the start. So in other words, what they'll say in these is, look, you gotta fix what you have and you can't keep buying and making inaccessible stuff. A lot of the time, the focus of the complaints is on products that uh, an entity purchases or uses. So it's not only about the things that we create. You know, for many of us, we have our own websites. We might create our own uh, PowerPoints for trainings. We have a lot of things that we control directly, but we probably have a lot of things that we purchase or use. So in other words, your website may be built on a platform and you might have actually contracted out with a designer or a firm to do all the web design for you. Because they do that design doesn't mean that you're off the hook. You know, if, if you are the entity that, that initiates this, that goes in and says, hey, we want you to build a website for us, then you're the one still held responsible for accessibility in that website. And one of the things that I've noticed, and we have some colleagues not too far away from uh, where we are here in Oklahoma who have pointed this out to me uh, more recently becoming a trend, the settlements more and more include all technology. So I'll contrast that. Let's say 2013, 2014, a student in higher education can't get through a class in, in their institution. And it's because maybe the, the course software isn't accessible. So a settlement agreement that would come out of a complaint like that, it might really focus on the course management software. There may be some other things. Uh, there may be some things in the way that disability services handled or didn't handle this particular situation. But more and more what's happened is instead of the settlement focusing on one part of the technology environment, they say all of your technology has to be accessible. So in that same situation where a student couldn't get through their class, now the settlement agreement is much more likely to say that you have to make your course management software accessible, all of your course material accessible, your website, your uh, human relations software where people might look for jobs or apply for jobs online, et cetera, et cetera. So they have these so-called all technology settlement agreements that are coming out now. And in talking to our, our colleagues, uh, as I mentioned, I think that's a trend that is more than likely going to stick around for a little while. Uh, and I think some of that comes out of the fact that these settlement agreements have been issued for years now. You know, since 2010 was kind of the first big one that involved a major nationwide retailer and got a lot of folks' attention. So the the margin of error has gotten quite a bit smaller. So this, uh, I don't usually read text from slides, 
when I do, it'll sound like I do here in just a moment. But I think that this definition of accessible in the context of technology is pretty helpful. So this comes from one settlement. Um, I plucked this from a settlement between the Department of Education and the University of Montana that goes back to 2014. The same definition is used a lot. If you start looking at settlement agreements and some of the, the issued statements from the enforcement agencies, you'll hear them or you'll read or, or hear them define accessible to say that it means that individuals with disabilities are able to independently acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and enjoy the same services within the same time frame as individuals without disabilities with substantially equivalent ease of use. Yes, that's a really long sentence. There are a few key things that I want to pick out of it. Uh, one, independence is stressed right off the bat. Uh, you know, no one should ever ask anybody who uses assistive technology to have a friend fill out their web form for them. That's not how this works. That's not the goal of the civil rights environment. The word same is actually in this sentence four different times. Same information, same interactions, same services, same time frame. So it doesn't say that somebody has to interact with their device in the same way. It says same interactions, but that has a lot more to do with, well, if somebody who uses a screen reader tries to use this website in the same way that someone that doesn't use a screen reader tries to use it, they should end up getting to the same place. So it's much more about the web component, the web piece, than it is the device that someone uses. And then the last concept is the one that's pretty familiar if you're knowledgeable about the civil rights environment, the, the, the concept of substantially equivalent ease of use means kind of what it sounds like, that we understand it might not be completely equivalent, but it needs to be as close as is possible. And I think this is where the, the respect for an understanding of different device interactions comes into play. So when these settlements come in, there are some common outcomes. And I, I look at, at settlements and have long looked at, at the settlements that are published as really great learning tools. If you're looking around your entity, just your department, and you're trying to figure out, well, what are some of the best practices? A lot of the settlement agreements start to map these things out. And again, I think they've become more specific here uh, in, in recent years, especially if you look at an agency or a higher ed institution or company-wide uh, settlement agreement they almost always say that somebody needs to be appointed to oversee technology accessibility. And that doesn't mean that they're like the, the, the departmental safety officer and it's just another hat that's placed on their head. This means that you have someone who's actively involved in forming an accessibility program for the entity. They are really consistent in the settlement agreements at pointing to the web content accessibility guidelines version two level double a for right now we'll leave it at that we can get into discussions of versions and levels at some other time the important thing and the consistent thing is that this is the standard that has been cited for gosh i'm going to say the last 10 ish years maybe a little bit less in settlement agreements in issuances from enforcement agencies this has been the standard set and this is the standard set, as I said a few minutes ago, that's often the basis of state policy. There's almost always a requirement to form a plan. And that means looking at the stuff that you create, the stuff that you buy, the stuff that you use, and bringing everybody who's involved in all of those different things, that's creating, buying, or making use decisions, and coming up with a plan that addresses those. Part of that plan is almost always training people. Uh, a lot of the training that we have begun to do with our peer Technology Act programs is about how to make, for example, Word documents more accessible. Um, PowerPoints, you know, we'll, we'll get into uh, testing a little bit actually in our next webinar in a couple of weeks. So training is a huge, huge part of this conversation. And speaking just from, from my experience, it's one of the biggest needs that entities have when they come to us with questions about accessibility. And one of the things that is, is required 
is to document the entity's progress. So let's say that you, you have a plan. Well, then you need to keep track of how well and how quickly you're putting that plan into place. So that's a big part of it as well. Okay, I'll pause again and see what questions you all might have. We're gonna shift away from the policy piece and move more into uh, just a handful of ways that you can make your little corner of the web a little bit more accessible. Everyone fell asleep while I was talking about policy because it's after lunch for many of us. It's tough, I understand. So now we'll get into a little bit of nuts and bolts kind of stuff. This is five ways, maybe plus a bonus, depending on how you slice and dice these, to make a more accessible web. I mentioned this first one um, a few minutes ago. I talked about the importance of making sure that section and subsection headings are actually headings structurally, that they're not just a bigger font, maybe that's bolded. You want the visible distinction for sure, but it's really important that back behind the screen, there's a structure. And that structure on the web and in say Microsoft Word is really, really similar. In both cases, say you're updating a web page, you probably have some place in the editor that you use where you can select a heading style for a particular heading or subheading. In Word, you have a set of styles up in the Word ribbon in the Home tab, and it, they're just labeled as heading one, two, three, etc. So it doesn't matter really what environment you're writing content in, you should be able to assign these heading styles to a given heading. And when you do that, it changes the visual. So the heading does generally become larger and the formatting changes a little bit so that it, it looks different from paragraph text. But when you use those styles, it creates the structure behind the screen. And that's critical for folks that use, in particular, screen readers or braille displays because once you apply a heading style, say you have your main heading on a page, you put it in uh, heading one, because it's the first heading and the main heading for that particular page. When a screen reader hits that, it's going to announce not only the text, but also the fact that it's the first level heading, which is incredibly important in creating that equivalence of experience. If all you do is create your headings visually, and say you have three sections in a document, and you have a main section and two subsections, when someone using a screen reader hears the headings read aloud, it's just gonna read the text unless you apply the appropriate styles. So this is a super easy one. And there are a lot of benefits in Microsoft Word to using styles. Uh, heading styles are the basis for things like tables of contents that you can gener generate automatically and update automatically. Uh, it also makes it much easier for people to navigate through the document you know, if a sighted reader comes in and takes a look at a document that we haven't seen before, at least my tendency is to kind of skim the headings just to get an idea of what all is in this page. Well, so screen reader users can do the same thing as long as the headings are created properly just by hitting the H key in their screen reader. The screen reader will announce each heading and its level. So if you have, again, main section and two subsections, It'll read the first heading and say this is heading level one. It will read the next and say that it's a level two heading, which is the cue to let somebody know that this is a subsection of the, the section before it. So again, we're looking for ways to make the experience more equivalent and to put this information out so that assistive technologies can either report it out as we're talking about with the screen reader or maybe so that people can interact with it if they're using you know, Dragon or, or something like that. Really similarly, and also really quick to do, is to create an actual list. If you're in newer versions of Microsoft Office, it's almost hard not to do this because Office steps in automatically and starts to format the list the right way. Uh, if you're in, I wanna say any version maybe prior to 2013 in Office, but it may go back further. 
then let's say you type a list the way that I was taught, um, which was this. Hit the tab key to give yourself some visible space. And then for a bullet, use the asterisk. So I would tab over an asterisk and then I would start typing my list. I'd hit enter and then I'd tab over asterisk type the next thing in the list. So very similar problem with that as we had with not using heading styles, which is when a screen reader encounters that list item, it's just going to read the list item. And the problem with that is that lists are usually really, really different than paragraphs that we type up. Lists are often brief. You know, a list item may not even really be a complete sentence. It may just be a sentence fragment. So because lists are a very different type of content, we need to be sure that the numbered lists that we have or the bulleted lists that just have bullets are actually structured properly. One of the, the things that I think people overlook from the visible side is that back in the day when I did use asterisks and the tab key, I would often spend a couple of minutes trying to get all of my indentation right if one of my list items went from one line to the next. So then I'm tabbing and backspacing and it takes a fair amount of time. If you just use your little list button, which again, no matter what tool you're writing content in, there should be a little button that looks like it has a little list on it. It might have three little bullets that you can see on the button and it'll have in most environments a label that will announce that it's to format an unordered or bulleted list. There should also be a button for numbered lists and it'll be very similar. The icon usually just shows a one and two and a three. And in general, uh, those controls are there just about everywhere. A couple of more points, um, and then Jose, I'll get to your question. When you use the list formatting, it handles that indentation for you. So you don't have to worry about cleaning up your left indentation line. And it creates a structure around the list. And in this case, on the screen, I've got a four item list. The screen reader, when it hits this list, will announce list with four items. So right off the bat, just like a sighted reader, somebody using the screen reader will know, oh, this is different content and expect different content to be read. So just like with the heading styles, we create a more equivalent experience for people who are reading the content, whether they're reading it visibly or with a screen reader or braille display. Um, Jose's question is, does the real list matter what glyph is used on a bulleted list? From an accessibility side, no, not really, except some of the characters can be read differently by screen readers. So some of the little icons that might replace a bullet in an unordered list might have um, extra characters behind them that define them. I don't know if any of you have ever done work with the web and you've copied something from a word file, pasted it into a web page, and you get just all these extra characters. Sometimes they're where you do an enter, uh, and sometimes those extra characters can define some of the bullets. So you can choose a bullet that actually adds more to uh, a screen reader user's experience and it kind of takes away by adding because it can read aloud some extra characters. I don't know off the top of my head which ones to avoid, but that is a consideration. Um, generally, the bullets, depending on how the screen reader is, is configured for the individual user, um, it may or may not read that there's a bullet, may just read the list item and move on. But again, there are some of those icons that have uh, a bigger definition, basically, and you can end up with some extra stuff in there. Uh, if you want to follow up on that, I'm going to give you my email address later and I can dig in and try to figure out uh, which of those are potentially problematic. So I want to skip to talk about visual elements for a, a minute uh, because the web and any article you read, especially if it's uh, about marketing and web, it's all about video, which is actually out of scope of today. It's also all about visuals. And if you go to a lot of web pages, the very first thing that you see, and it may be just about the only thing you see, is an image of something. Maybe it's students on a campus lawn, maybe it's a group of happy looking employees, but that's the first piece of content that people encounter visibly when they get to a, a homepage. 
So visuals, when, when they're used to convey meaning, that meaning isn't available if you, someone's relying on a screen reader and the author or the designer doesn't provide it. So we have something called alternative text. And my suggestion to you to find out where this is and how to get to it in the tools that you use is just to search, say, Word 2016 alternative text. And that will probably take you exactly to a place where you can find out how to put alternative text into a Word document using 2016. Um, in general, alternative text serves as the primary meaning of the image for folks that can't see it. It needs to be concise. It needs to be meaningful. It needs to convey the intended meaning. And it's usually entered in some kind of a context menu. In some versions of Office, actually, we see differences. And it's similar with web-based tools as well. Sometimes you might right-click on an image or do uh, whatever command opens up your context menus. I think it's, it's a Shift F10 in Office. And there will be either a sea of menus to go through, or if you're on the latest version of Office, when you click on the image, a button appears in the ribbon where you can add or edit alternative text. They've made it much easier to get to. The mechanics you can Google for, uh, but the, the purpose is to be sure that when someone includes an image in their content, that the meaning of that image is conveyed, whether a reader can see it or not. So on the screen here, I've got a picture of a scissor tail fly catcher that's flying uh, by the side of a lake. So I'm an Oki, born and bred, and the scissor tail fly catcher is the state bird of Oklahoma. So alternative text is contextual. What I might write in one setting may not work for another. Quick example with this picture of this bird. Uh, let's say that I'm writing about state symbols. Well, the important thing about this bird in that article may really just be that the scissor tail flycatcher is the state bird of Oklahoma. That might be it. What it looks like, the fact that it's by a lake, maybe none of that matters in the context of state symbols. Let's say that I'm writing an article about bird watching. Well, then the description of the bird becomes a lot more important. So my alternative text may be quite a bit more descriptive, or it might talk about how the bird takes its name from the fact that the male scissor tails have tail feathers that look kind of like scissors, opening and closing as they fly. So your alternative text, you should put a little bit of thought into it. And I'll leave you with this as, as guidance to consider how to write good alternative text. Think about how you would read a slide like this, a web page, a document page to somebody over the telephone. And whatever you might say when you reach that image should be a pretty good indicator of what your alternative text needs to be. Questions on that? Alternative text is fundamental to the web and can also be tricky. It's usually a sentence, maybe two. Sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. All right, I'm going to move on to another visual element of web accessibility. Here I've got a pretty simple line graph. I've got three series of data across four categories, and these are on a plot in, in this graph. Series one is indicated with a blue line. Series two is indicated with a red line. And series three is indicated with a green line. Any problems with that? Anybody want to venture to guess in the chat or just type it in if you know what could be a problem with the way this is presented. Let's say that someone can't perceive the difference in colors. So what's on here now is a grayscale version of that same little line graph. Now the colors, the lines, they're, they're basically the same. Uh, this can happen too if you take that same color graph and uh, print it on a black and white printer for whatever reason. The meaning goes away completely. I, I can't tell the difference. Even if I, I don't have color blindness or a different form of low vision, I can't tell which is which. 
So what our web standards say is that it's perfectly fine to use color to convey meaning. And especially with data visualizations and charts and graphs, it's really, really helpful to use color. The key is not to only use color. So you need to use something in addition to color. So in this case, I just added markers along each one of these lines. Now series one is blue, but also has triangles along it. Series two is red and has diamonds along it. Series three is green with squares along it. So again, if I, if I can't perceive the difference in color, if I print this in grayscale, I can still tell which line is which. To get into another example of this, I've got this pie chart. And I've got four categories here. Um, two of them are represented with blue and, and gray. Two are represented with different shades of brown. I got a lot of problems with this. Uh, this, this fails on a lot of levels. It, it fails in terms of our standards for the reason that I just talked about. Color is the only thing that tells the difference between these four pie slices. I think it, it also has some challenges because the colors, at least the two sets of colors, are really close to one another and kind of hard to, to distinguish visually from one another. So I built this actually in PowerPoint. Um, PowerPoint and Word both will let you say, you know, grab a table out of Excel and use it as a data source for a table or for a chart or a graph like this. So that's what I did here. And I messed around with the settings a little bit. You can get into some submenus and find ways to do things like make the borders between the pie slices bigger. So I just have a white border between each slice that is giving a little bit of visual separation from them. You can also actually spread the pie slices out from one another a little bit as well. Either one of those makes it easier to tell where one slice ends and another begins. We still have the problem though where category one is blue, but I don't really necessarily know if this is in black and white or if I have low vision, which slice is blue. So again, in PowerPoint or other office tools and hopefully in any web tools that you use, you can do something like this where I just moved the category labels so that they're right next to each one of the pie slices that they apply to. So I do have the color differences. I'm just not color coding the different categories. Again, it's not a matter of thinking that you can't use color to convey meaning. It's a matter of thinking about what else in addition to color can I add so that I'm not only using that color. One of the big issues that we see on the web, and at this slide is about color contrast, uh, has a phrase on it that is usually pretty readable on a monitor. When I do this with a projector, sometimes it's just gone. Uh, the phrase appears, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, and it's in a really, really light blue up against a white background. Very difficult to read. A pretty clear color contrast fail. Um, that's why the, the body text in all of these slides is actually a darker blue. And it makes it not only much easier to read in general, but it makes it possible for folks to read it even if they have a form of low vision that makes the, the, the low contrast stuff really difficult or impossible to pick up on. So color contrasts, I got a whole soapbox that I don't have time to get on about it because it's something that when we do web accessibility assessments at Able Tech, we note probably 95 to 99% of the time as a fail. So it happens really, really commonly. It's very frequently something that people overlook, and it's really important to the web. I tell people all the time, what's the point of typing something if you're gonna make it hard for people to read? You can actually use a tool, um, and we'll try to get the slides uh, out to you all. Uh, for those of you whose emails we can, we can grab, um, otherwise we'll put them up on the AT3 Center website here. There's a tool called uh, the TPG Color Contrast Analyzer, and it's linked here in the slides, but if you search TPG Color Contrast Analyzer, and especially if you search it with the European spelling of Color Contrast Analyzer, so C-O-L-O-U-R, and Analyzer with an S instead of a Z, it'll be the first thing that pops up. Uh, I'm not gonna walk through it right now to, out of respect of y'all's time. It makes it super easy to uh, grab a foreground color using a little eyedropper and grab the background color 
and it will tell you exactly what the contrast ratio between those two is. Contrast ratio is defined in accessibility standards and for regular size text, we, we know that we need to have a ratio of four and a half to one text color to background color. So it's also one of the things in accessibility that is easiest to measure and quantify and say, no, this is at 2.5 to one, this doesn't hit the standard, you need to make you know, your background color or text color adjustments to make the difference between them be greater so people can actually read it. The contrast uh, rule right now doesn't apply to text in logos in the current standards in section 508. One of the fun things about web standards is that they change at the international level and then different countries around the world might adopt those changes uh, more locally, if you will. So right now, text and logos is exempt, but I won't be surprised in the next, well, nothing moves that quickly, so I'll say five or 10 years, there's a shift in that uh, lack of a contrast requirement for text and logos. So I will leave you with a couple of resources, uh, three specifically, that uh, I find really, really helpful. Uh, some of it we have, have created through the AT3 Center, and there's a set of resources, and we really link out to other folks uh, from this particular page. Uh, you can search the AT or you can search for AT3 Center ICT Accessibility, and it's probably going to get you to this page or just a link away from it. And again, the URLs and links are in the slides. The other two are also really, really helpful. And in fact, I think we link out to them from the AT3 Center site. But WebAIM, WebAIM, is a group out of Utah State University. They do training all over the world. Um, they have very well-written and easy to read articles about just about anything you can think about uh, that has to do with accessibility on the web. And the World Wide Web Consortium has a web accessibility initiative. And I can shorten this one a lot for you if you want to just Google it. If you just search for W3C, WAI, you're going to get to their information. These are the folks that write the standards at the international level. And in the last probably five years, they have totally overhauled all of their website so that it's outrageously easy to use. And they have articles uh, similar to WebAIM on how to make specific kinds of content accessible. They also have articles about things like building a business case for accessibility. So if you have a, a spark about this, uh, but maybe your leadership or your department or your agency doesn't, they might have some, some things that would be helpful in kind of building that case. I, I think that both of those, WebAIM and the World Wide Web Consortium, have put tremendous time into organizing and writing their content so that it's easy to use, and I can't recommend them highly enough. There are others out there, and the World Wide Web Consortium is a place where you can certainly link out to a bunch of other information sources about accessibility, uh, really just almost to your heart's content. So I do wanna see uh, before we wrap up here, we've got about another minute officially. Uh, I just want to see what kinds of questions y'all may have. Again, feel free to, to put those into the uh, chat window or to unmute yourself and, uh, and fire them off audibly. That's no problem either. But this is a great time to bounce a few questions out there. And if I don't have time to answer, then I'm certainly happy to get back to you. Uh, again, I'm Rob Carr. I'm the Accessibility Program Manager at Oklahoma Able Tech, and you can email me directly if there's anything that you might want to follow up with me about. You can email me at rgcarr, that's R-G-C-A-R-R, -R, at okstate.edu, and I'm certainly happy to um, you know, answer your questions via email. And again, if, if there's anything that you want to run by me here while we are together just for another couple of minutes today, uh, then please just let me know. All right, well, with that and seeing that it is now officially three o'clock, I want to really thank you for your time today. Uh, I very much appreciate you all giving me an hour to come and, and talk at you, as we say in this part of the world. 
So uh, if, if you have follow-up, feel free to send it in. And otherwise, everyone have a fantastic day. And thank you again.